Myron Cohen, Director of Columbia University's Weatherhead East Asian Institute. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming to the special symposium. This year, 2009, marks the 60th anniversary of the Institute, and today's event is the first of the three symposia we are holding in East Asia. Our June 3rd symposium will be in Tokyo, and June 10th in Seoul. Now, if any of you are in, in, in the area of those cities, you're cordially invited to attend them as well. Since its establishment in uh, 1949, the, Weatherhead, the East Asian Institute has been a major center for research, teaching, and publishing in modern and contemporary East Asia, covering China, Japan, and the Korean Peninsula. In recent years, they've also begun to focus on the countries of Southeast Asia. The Institute is within Columbia University School of Arts and Sciences and has important links with the schools of business law and international and public affairs, as well as many other uh, university units. Um, it, the Institute brings together over 50 full-time faculty, a diverse group of visiting scholars and professionals, and students from the United States and abroad. We are one of four major resources at Columbia University with a specific focus on East Asia. The others are the CV Star East Asian Library, the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, and most recently, the Columbia Global Center right here in Beijing. We work together with our many Columbia partners, such as the co-sponsors of today's program, as well as with our partner institutions in China and elsewhere in the world. The Weatherhead East Asian Institute's mission is to train new generations of experts in the humanities, social sciences, and professions, and to en enhance understanding of East Asia in the wider community. Among other things, we are set apart in that our outlook incorporates humanistic and social science orientations. It is civilizational and global, with, institutional, with institute faculty and scholars distinguished by their interdisciplinary and multinational focus. Both today's program and the sequence of events in Beijing preceding it exemplify this interdisciplinary orientation. But there is more. For the Weatherhead East Asian Institute is a center of education for a broad span of age groups as well as disciplines. We work with educators whose teaching ranges from pre-kindergarten through high school so as to introduce East Asia into their curriculum. We have developed and are rapidly expanding uh, our undergraduate I initiative within Columbia University itself. At the graduate level, we administer an East Asian Regional Studies Master of Arts program. We provide an array of student fellowships and scholarships to undergraduate and graduate students alike. We offer a variety of postgraduate fellowships or visitor programs. We have a program of year-long residence at Columbia for mid-career professionals in areas such as government and the media. And we provide expert knowledge to leaders, policymakers, and business professionals. Our range of educational and research support program covers, covers much of a lifespan. This, our 60th anniversary, is an opportunity for us to reflect on past, current, and future East Asia initiatives by the Institute and by Columbia University, and to build stronger alliances across the East Asia region especially with our alumni, but also with academic colleagues and professionals from various walks of life. We invite you all to continue to participate in our programs and to visit our institute next time you are in New York. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Nicholas Dirks, who is Vice President for the Arts and Sciences at Columbia University and Dean of the Faculty. With some details of his distinguished career given your program guide, I want to note here that Professor Dirk's participation in our 60th anniversary program demonstrates both his and the university's commitment to and support of our educational and research goals. Professor Dirks. Thank you, Professor Cohen. It is my very great pleasure on behalf of Columbia University to welcome you to this symposium on Colombia and China, past and future. As part of the 60th anniversary of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, we are here to celebrate the extraordinary importance of China, not just in and for the world, but today specifically in and for the history and future of Colombia. 
Columbia has been known not just as one of the leading universities in the United States, but, and this is of course not unrelated, as one that early on recognized the extent to which it could only realize its potential by recruiting both the best and the brightest from across the globe, and by establishing serious programs for the scholarly study of the world, perhaps most significantly in the case of China and East Asia. Columbia's excellence was thus almost from the start tangled up in the history of China. Indeed, Columbia has played a central role in the story of modern China from the 19th century, when it was among the first American universities to admit students from China. Many Chinese attended Columbia and after graduation returned here to become influential statesmen, scientists, philosophers, and educators. The long list of prominent alumni begins with Tang Xiaoyi, who entered Columbia in 1880 and later became the first Prime Minister of the Republic of China in 1912. One of Columbia's most noted alums is Hu Xu, who came to Columbia to study philosophy for his PhD under John Dewey, and went on to play a major role in modern Chinese thought. He wrote his dissertation on the development of logical method in ancient China, and went on to become a professor of philosophy at Beijing University, and a strong backer of the movement to write in the vernacular cadences of ordinary speech. He used the authority of such great pre-modern novels as The Dream of the Red Chamber to argue for narrative clarity and flexibility, in short, for literary modern modernism in a specifically Chinese idiom. An important May 4th intellectual, he nevertheless remained the Deweyan pragmatist, negotiating even in those turbulent times the sometimes contradictory relationships between tradition and modernity. A leader of the modern, modernist literary renaissance in Republican China, he also played an increasingly public role, becoming China's ambassador to the United States, president of Beijing University, and subsequently president of the, Acad of the Academy of Sin Sinica in Taiwan. Following in his footsteps was Feng Yulan, another student of John Dewey, who went on to become the leading figure in Chinese philosophy uh, across the first half of the 20th century. V.K. Wellington Ku was in the class at Columbia of 1908, got his PhD in 1912 and an honorary degree in 1917, and he, of course, contributed greatly to the development of a modern Chinese foreign service, later becoming Chinese ambassador to the United States, foreign minister, acting prime minister of the Republic of China, and vice president of the International Court of Justice in the Hague. T.F. Chang, a graduate of the Department of Public Law and Government, served as China's permanent representative at the United Nations. Also at the UN was another, the amazing group of Chinese students who came to Columbia to study with Dewey, uh, P.C. Chang, who uh, actually did his degree at Teachers College in 1924 and played such an important role in the formulation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, about which we'll hear but more later in the panel uh, this afternoon. Chua Chao Ting in economics became a major figure in the development of the social sciences in Republican China. And these are only a very few of the members of a Columbia and educated set of generations who served so importantly in the development of 20th century Chinese thought and politics, but who also helped to define Chinese American cultural and diplomatic relations during a period when the serious study of China at Columbia was just getting underway. Indeed, Columbia's 20th century was marked by its early recognition of the importance of teaching about Chinese history, culture, and language. I'm pleased to note that the great Franz Boas, whose chair I sit upon, played, of course, such a role in the development of anthropology at Columbia and across the US, was also one of the leading spokespeople in Columbia in the early 20th century for the importance of Chinese studies. Uh, especially in the undergraduate curriculum as part of what, of course, became later the Columbia Core curriculum. The, Depi the Department of Chinese was established in 1901, but the primary impetus and support for this came from a much more unusual source. In 1901, Dean Lung, the valet of Horace Walpole Carpentier, the Columbia trustee at the end of the century, used his life savings to write a check for $12,000 to create a fund for Chinese learning in the university. Carpentier augmented the fund, and in 1902, Frederick Hertz, a German sinologist, was appointed as the first professor of Chinese at Columbia, which also received a large donation of books from the government of Imperial China. Noted scholars such as Cyrus Peake, 
and now carrying to Goodrich continued Columbia's serious engagement with Chinese studies throughout the middle of the 20th century. And of course, after World War II, as Professor Cohen has just told us, the Weatherhead Foundation, the Weatherhead uh, Institute, then the East Asian Institute, was established initially with support from foundations such as Rockefeller, Ford, and Carnegie, along, of course, with U.S. government support. And they naturally turned to Columbia, which had, have, which had half a century of experience and expertise in teaching and research concerning China. The East Asian Institute was formally established 60 years ago in 1949, though it did build on that long and distinguished prehistory that I just mentioned. But since 1949, the list of extraordinary scholars and students, teaching programs and research projects, provides an almost dizzying array of evidence of the centrality of China and East Asia more generally to the foundational intellectual and pedagogical mission of Columbia University. So while more than 130 years of engagement with China, we have allowed, have allowed Colombia to have a profound influence on China's political, artistic, social, financial, and technological development, it is just as important to note that scholarly engagement with China has had, and indeed continues to have, enormous impact on the United States. Currently, we host more than 1,200 students and scholars from China we have the third largest international student population of U.S. universities. On campus and abroad, we have numerous centers, initiatives, and exchange programs with a focus on China that address key issues in fields such as law, business, education, and medicine. And as Professor Cohen mentioned, we just established in March the first Columbia Global Center right here in Beijing to serve as a regional base for our larger endeavors in China. So it is important for us not just to celebrate, but also to sustain and find ways to further this extraordinary and very close history of relationship. How we engage with each other will be key to defining and resolving crucial global issues in the years ahead. You will see this today when we pool some of our considerable intellectual and scientific resources to discuss the common challenges of economic and environmental sustainability in the context of the global financial crisis. We will also explore the nature of our cultural interactions, how the past has influenced our present, and how our responses today will doubtless change the future itself. Many of you are graduates of Columbia, and through your success in academic and professional pursuits, you will have come to value, or at least we hope you have, even more than perhaps when you were in Morningside Heights, your Columbia experience. But we can't really ex express today how much we value this connection and its maintenance through events like this. Your contributions to campus and the support you continue to provide after you leave. Our faculty, our alumni, indeed our, all of our intellectual resources are all mutually interdependent. We are here today because of your ongoing support and your friendship. And so we celebrate this special friendship between Columbia and China, between the university and its larger community, this global community that has such an impressive and important presence here today in Beijing. Thank you very much.